Thanks for chiming in today. So excited to share this special presentation on the feathered Aquarian, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction and the total solar eclipse. Um, very excited. So just, uh, yeah, hi, Lauren. Say hi from uh, where you are today in the, the chat box. And I'm just gonna invite you to get your tea or whatever you need to get settled. And then we'll dive into our special class here today. We are going live on Facebook now. Awesome. Devers in Maryland, Sulas from Germany, Erica Aloha, Teresa, hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Canary Islands. Oh, where? Where? What island? I'm really being called back there, Antonietta. Um, I was in uh, Lanzarote. Unbelievable, and, uh, and and the Grand Canaria a few years ago. I love it out there. Valerie's in Ireland. I want to go to Ireland next year, too. Oh, El Giro, yay. I think that has the, uh, the observatory, one of the best in the world. Hi, Vicky. Great. Welcome, everyone. All right, I'm going to start to share my screen here, and let's... Uh, yes, there'll be a replay, uh, Valerie, if you have to leave early. Um, let's, oh, cancel. And uh, maybe Jocelyn, if you want to tell me, if you're able to tell me if uh, you just see the keynote. Yes, I just, yeah, I see your video and the keynote. Okay, great. And... I can still hear you, so maybe you can mute on your end. Awesome, all right. So again, welcome everyone. My name is Verda Luz from Divine Timing Coaching. And wow, it's, it's hard to believe that we're at the end of 2020 almost. Probably a lot of you have been <laughs> waiting for this time all year. Um, I know it's been very intense at times really dramatic and cathartic for all of us. But we're on the cusp of, of something brand new and I'm sure everyone is feeling it, that there is this time of great experimentation, innovation, invention, growth. And so I wanted to share this special class here today because we're at a very unique uh, and auspicious moment um, in, in the year um, and in this larger year, which, um, we could call the, the, the ages of man, the Aquarian and Piscean ages, and, and the cusp of this great shift that we're upon. Um, but it's also the middle of the eclipse window right now, almost near the solar eclipse. This is a very special solar eclipse, a total eclipse, very strong, and it's happening on Monday at the 23rd degree of Sagittarius. And what's really special about this is we have the eclipses in Gemini and Sagittarius. And this is really ushering us across a threshold. The threshold is connecting us with our source because the galactic center is at 27 degrees of Sagittarius. So this eclipse will be hitting the galactic center. We are gonna be getting these cosmic rays from the galactic center infusing this eclipse portal that we're in just before the grand conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in Aquarius. And I'm gonna get really deep into that. But for me, and for the astro mythology that seems to be unfolding with this transit, these cycles right now is we are all learning how to really wear our robe of feathers and become the feathered serpent. What does that mean? Well, that's our journey today into discovering this archetype of transformation, of alchemy, of civilization, of creativity. So we have this very interesting cycle with the Gemini eclipses, Gemini and Sagittarius eclipses always opposite each other. Um, you know, there was the 2012 end day prophecies in the Mayan calendar. There was all this talk of an alignment, a galactic alignment that was taking place in 2012. Well, it wasn't actually just about that, that specific date. We're, we're actually in that window right now. 
And this is a peak moment of this. What is that galactic alignment about? It has to do with the solar path called the ecliptic, the, the apparent path of the sun through the constellations and the galactic plane and where those two paths cross. And there's a lot of great literature on this topic. I'm not gonna go deep into it today, but to just say that the last time the Gemini Sagittarius eclipses were taking place was 2012 at this great prophetic moment where the Mayans predicted a, a shift of ages and a new kind of constant consciousness developing. But the interesting thing that, that we don't know, most people don't know about the, the, the whole alignment prediction was that there was also the nine underworlds, the nine years after the alignment, which is where we are now. And if you reverse the numbers, we come into 2021, nine years after 2012. And this is really fascinating. We'll see the Gemini Sagittarius eclipses again in 2029 and 30, which I think are gonna be extremely important right now uh, as well. But right now we are in this great shift and it's marked synchronistically with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius. And I really believe this is an invitation for us to work with this archetype of the feathered serpent. Part of the deal is that Gemini and the symbol of Gemini actually has the double serpents in it. And we're gonna get into that symbol a little bit more here, but here's an alchemical drawing with the sun and the moon and the double dragon. And here's the, the, the Gemini serpents, you know, and we have this rich mythology I've been sharing over the last few weeks and also in our mystery school about the downward facing, uh, downward descending uh, serpent of soul and the upward ascending serpent of spirit and how they twine together in the symbol of the caduceus, which I have on my arm right here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the symbol of Hermes, the psychopomp, the shaman going into the underworld and that journey of transformation as we work, we're gonna see with wrestling the serpents of the unconscious. And as we do that, as we merge with that Kundalini, that serpent energy, we start to gain our wings, our upper world journey, which is represented in Sagittarius, the constellation. So here you see uh, in Chichen Itza, where I was in 2012, the, uh, the serpent of light here, the feathered serpent. And here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is nine tiered pyramid, nine underworlds. And here's the serpent's mouth right here. And what we're leading towards here is a, a galactic cosmology. And I really believe that this cycle and this uh, transit of Jupiter and Saturn and Aquarius is inviting us into a deeper relationship, an expansive relationship with the storytelling, the storytelling in the skies, the great cosmic myths that have guided us for, you know, for thousands of years, but have really been forgotten by a lot of our modern generation. And if we study the myths of the stars cross-culturally, um, we can actually be guided, instructed on how to transform our souls and evolve. And that's what I'm gonna share with you here today is this journey that we see, if you can look here, this is one of the best maps I've ever found of this part of the sky, this sacred portal we call the Galactic Center and the Milky Way. And right here, you see Via Lactea. This is the, the Milky Way here, Via Lactea. And there's something very significant if you watch here. Now, we've been talking in some of the webinars over the last month about this very special area of the, the sky, the Galactic Center, which is where the scorpion's tail meets this, the, the arrow of Sagittarius, the archer, and the foot of Asclepius or Ophiuchus, who is the serpent bearer or the wrestler with the serpent. And this was based on the Greek god of healing, Asclepius, whose tradition, whose cult lasted for over 1500 years from the Greek, Roman, and even to the Christian era. Great dream chambers, healing sanctuaries where they would take poppies and other entheogens to awaken their consciousness, to meet the God of healing. And this has been our journey in the last month as the sun has been moving through actually Ophiuchus coming out of the underworld of Scorpio into this testing of our souls with the serpent, the unconscious, the shadow. And what happens here is this, this Sagittarian arrow that ports to our source, right? There's something else going on here. This serpent, right? And this shaman, 
they are connected with these three bird constellations. See along the Milky Way here. We have the, the lyra, which is of course the lyre, the sacred instrument that, or, um, that Orpheus, the great singer, songwriter, and musician of the ancient world, he played the lyre in his haunting songs, uh, mesmerized all the beasts of the world and all the, even the gods and the goddesses. But the lyre was also known as vulture. So we have the vulture. So I'm gonna share a little, little bit about the myth of the vulture. And then we also have the eagle, Akila, the bird sent actually by Zeus to kill the great healer uh, Asclepius because he was raising beings from the dead because his skills with the serpent medicine, medicine was so astute uh, that, that Hades got jealous and told Zeus, hey brother, you gotta, you gotta kill this, this, uh, this serpent healer. And Aquila, the eagle was sent down. But there's a rich mythology with the eagle and the serpent. It's even in the Mexican flag. And it's the merger again of the feathered serpent, which we see also with the swan. And there's a rich mythology with the swan here. So we have these three birds right above the serpent, feathers above the serpent. And here's the shaman dancing with that energy. And he's about to get stung in his ankle by the scorpion and hit by the arrow of Sagittarius here, all in the galactic center. This is a very perilous and dangerous journey. And this is the journey all of us have been on. And it's the journey that the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction invites us into really fully understanding. So let's get into it deeper. What is the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction? Well, December 21st, we have this extremely rare event. Not that Jupiter and Saturn conjoining are rare. That happens every 20 years. Now that's significant, but what's more significant is that in this year, they are meeting in a new elemental sign, which is the sign of Aquarius, which is an air sign. For the last 200 plus years, they've met in earth signs, except for in 1980. What does that mean? Well, the grand conjunction has been studied by astrologers for millennia, actually. And it's something that seems to mark a shift in the collective zeitgeist, the overarching themes and motifs of our planet. We've really looked at the dominance of the earth plane, you know, for better or worse in the last 200 years, especially the industrial revolution, how we've in a lot of ways raped the earth of her resources. We've learned how to use it sometimes wisely and sometimes not. But we're moving into this much more ethereal space with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius. It marks 200 years that we will see that conjunction in air signs, which means that we're moving into this much more virtual, much more mental, uh, technological space in our collective consciousness. They would say that this was like, um, sort of a royal decree that would take place when Jupiter and Saturn would come into the sky. And speaking of a royal decree, this conjunction has been likened to the Star of Bethlehem. There was a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that would have been very visible, very strong in the sign of Pisces. We know the Piscean age is really governed by the entire mythos of Christ. That would have taken place around 6 BC. And there's a lot of other evidence that this might have been you know, very, very accurate time of, of the birth of, of, of Jesus Christ. And this, um, you know, around 2 BC, there was also a Venus-Jupiter conjunction that would have been very bright in the sky. We think that this bright star, you know, this heralding of, of the, the king of Judea, which was the great prophecy at that time, you know, everyone who was connected with the astral mysteries, which would have been the Chaldean astrologers called the Magi, would have known about this event. And they would have followed this, this prophecy and this prediction. We know that those Chaldean astrologers were, were kings, they were wise men, uh, but they were astrologers. And this would have been a very, very powerful event. There's some incredible literature about this as well. But just to note that we have this Christmas star this year, this conjunction will be very visible from, you know, I mean, it's very close right now. If you haven't been out looking at Jupiter and Saturn, you've got to do it. Look at the Southern sky right after sunset, you'll start to see Jupiter, Saturn right there. And over the next couple of weeks, they will be very, very close. In fact, they'll be within a 10th of a degree, like, like in the sky, they'll be in the same exact portion of the sky. And Jupiter, sorry, Saturn 
will be as close to Jupiter as like Jupiter's moons if you look through a telescope. So it's gonna be extremely powerful to behold and we won't see them this close or in the sign of Aquarius. We haven't seen that since about 1266. So, and we won't see them this close until like 1280. So most of us won't probably be here. So the Christmas star, this magic that's coming. And I believe that it's, it's, it's a rebirth for all of us under the Christmas tree, the tree of life, where the shaman is dancing from the up, lower worlds to through the middle worlds and the upper worlds as he wrestles with the serpents of the unconscious and gains his or her wings to ascend to the upper realms. Jupiter and Saturn, the great conjunction. It's exact December 21st on the winter solstice this year. And again, this is what we've just shared, the air signs, the earth signs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this talk talking about what it means for Jupiter to be in Aquarius or Saturn to be in Aquarius. I'll give you a few key words. That's gonna be a big portion of my three hour talk next week, um, which is the 2021 astro numerology forecast where we'll go through every planetary shift and all the retrogrades and the eclipses and we'll learn how to embody those cycles. But what I want you to take forward with this is that we are entering this really powerful new um, dynamic. Now, some people think that this might be, you know, the birth of the Aquarian age, but the, the ages are determined in a very different way. And it has to do with the vernal equinox and where the, the North Pole of the earth is pointing to. And that shift doesn't really take place for another couple hundred years for out of Pisces to Aquarius. But is this an infusion of, of Aquarian energy in a big way? Absolutely. It's very, very strong. And we, we're coming out of this hugely intense Capricorn year, right? With Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto. And we can sense that what we are emerging into is a, a time where we are going to feel that we need to rebel against the old world. And that's on a personal and collective level. We need more egalitarian energy that, that all people can experience certain kinds of freedoms and liberated ideals. Uh, it's a humanitarian transit. And it's about learning how to systematize and bring structures in which we can grow in. Growth, we always associate it with Jupiter, but growth can also come with Saturn. Jupiterian growth is all about the faith to um, seize opportunities, to positively, optimistically learn and, and grow into the future horizon, right? Jupiter wants us to see what's, what's potential in the world and to, to get ourselves expanding literally, viscerally by travel, by studying philosophy and religion and, and things that bring meaning to our life. But Saturn grows us through contraction, through focus, through discipline. So we need to discipline ourselves in our expansion, in our development of our spiritual senses in an Aquarian way. And so we're gonna see this expansion and also concentration of technology in a new way. It's gonna speed up. And by the end of this year, I'm sure we're gonna have different technologies that we've never even seen before. We'll talk a lot more about this next, next week. Um, working with artificial intelligence, working with robotics, working with free energy technologies, elemental energies like the air and wind technology, especially air, right? Air element. Um, of course, we will have more about the idea of airborne diseases and pandemics being a big theme with this. Cryptocurrency as well. The digitalization of so much of our lives. Look at what's happened this year. So what, what's seeding this year is really a seed, uh, this next year is a seed of the next 20 years. We're gonna see a lot of that. And so it's a very important year for all of us. Um, and you, know, you can look back in previous cycles um, which I'll talk a lot more about next week, when Jupiter was in Aquarius or Saturn was in Aquarius or those Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions, which were every 20 years. What we know was 2000. Look at, look at how much the internet grew in that time period. Look at what was happening in 1980 as well. There were certain technological advancements and every 10 years during the opposition or the conjunction, we see this huge uh, uh, eruption in terms of emergent technological advancement and how we identify as a collective and what our collective trends are, which is a very Aquarian topic, the sort of trend of humanity. 
right? And the vision that we collectively share. So when we look forward, I wanna to talk to you about why I believe this is a time when astrology is also gonna be so important. Here you see this beautiful image from the great uh, Jacob Bem, who was a uh, you know, astrologer, mystic, astronomer, um, alchemist, obviously this is an alchemical drawing. And we see the bird here. We're gonna to start to talk about the bird constellations. This is um, the Holy Spirit. And I, I really believe that this cycle of Aquarius, remember it's an air sign, it's a sign of energy and ethers, can, can really infuse all of us with the Holy Spirit. And there's a big reason for this because of these bird constellations. Let's look at those constellations. Again, here's Cygnus the Swan with Deneb Adiji, the great shaman star in Deneb here in Cygnus. And we have a Vega, one of the brightest stars in the sky in Lyra the Harp or Lyra the Vulture. Uh, as well. And then you see this is Ocula and Altair is one of the great stars here, which is actually Jupiter and Saturn's conjunction point. They will be conjoining on the great star Aldair. Bold and daring and courageous is this star. And we see this as the summer triangle. Again, the strongest shape in nature, this triangle here. So I want to share, I'm going to read here a little bit from um, a text that, that I actually began about 12 years ago, about 10 years ago, working on my second book, Aquarius Dawns. But it's actually about this mystical area of the sky, the galactic center, the Milky Way, and about the birds. So I'll leave you with this image here, which is the Ba. And I'm going to read you a bit from this passage here. So let me pull this up for everyone. So, theriomorph. So, a theriomorph is when we morph into this animal ally, this animal spirit. Birds have always represented the soul's capacity to ascend. Many cultures believing that departing birds are like souls leaving the earth. Like a soul, the ba is an aspect of a person that the ancient Egyptians believed that would live, leave the body after it died. And it was sometimes depicted as this human-headed bird or a kite flying out of the tomb to join with the Ka or the eternal spirit in the afterlife. Now, when we look at Egyptian iconography and really the whole history of, of the mystery traditions is connected with Egypt, right? Um, we can also see here Tehuti or Jehuti or Thoth, ibis-headed god, bird-headed god. Even here you could see potentially the scales of the serpent as part of the costume. And so what we see that this god Tehuti, one of the arch gods of the, the pantheon, god of the moon, of learning, of scribing, of teaching, right? The inventor of writing, the creator of languages, magic, advisor of the gods, fundamental in weighing the heart with ma'at, the heart of justice and, and truth in us, a bird god. We see the bird gods even in the Anunnaki, in those famous images from the Sumerian tablets where the birds are feeding the, the pineal gland and, and basically giving humans their, their spiritual consciousness. And one of the oldest images in the world that we have of, of the shamanic traditions is the Lascaux cave. And here you see the bird man. This is one of the first kind of shamanic archetypes we see painted. And it's really suggesting the magical flight of the, the, the shaman in trance experience. Siberian shamans wear bird costumes in their initiation rites, and they make sacrifice at a sacred tree, which is a guardian door of the other world. And the shaman in training must climb that tree, which is the cosmic tree, or in a dream, he must climb that tree to meet the peak of the bird topped tree. So the bird is at the top of the tree. And the shaman's ascent and empowerment is symbolized by this morphing into the winged one. This is called theriomorphism, morphing into the animal ally. Right? So in the Mayan world, the shaman king is an itzam. And this itzam is one who actually does the act of its. And the its is the, the, power, the, the power of the cosmos. It's the energy on a cosmic scale. It's like the chi, right? 
And it's likened to the sap of the world tree. I keep coming back to the theme of the world tree and the bird atop the world tree. And what spirals around that world tree is the serpent, is the serpent of the, the, the consciousness itself, the soul embodied. So the tree is the conduit of communication between the supernatural and the human world. And even in the Mayan world, you see these public monuments where all of the, the, the ancestral energy, the totemic energies were, were all uh, carved into the world tree. And it was always perceived as a double-headed serpent to bar. Two serpents, right? Very much the, the, the caduceus again. So what I want to point out is that when you go back to the constellations, this Milky Way is also the tree of life. And in the traditions, in the cosmologies, in the mythologies, the, the Milky Way was always the, the, like the life force of the, the sky goddess Newt or the milk of the goddess. And so it it's, has to do with, again, that it's, that cosmic sap, the life force. And so here's the tree of life. Here's the shaman on the tree. Here's the serpent and the birds meeting. So in alchemy, this um, stage, here's an alchemical image with the serpents, so beautiful, the serpents and the birds, the double-headed eagle, right? Ocula, the swan, Cygnus, black swan, and here's Phoenix. And the Phoenix is the higher expression of the eagle, which is also a higher expression of the scorpion. And so when we look at the Jed pillar, in Egypt, we have this image as well of the tree of life. This is the spinal column of Osiris, the god of resurrection. It's also the double helix, the DNA, and the spiraling of uh, the, the double serpents. There's the serpent above the jet pillar here and one of the hieroglyphs with the Ankh as well, the, 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 the symbol of life. And here, alchemical images and, and mystic iconography through time has always symbolized this ladder. This is from Freemasonry. Here's the all seeing eye at the top here, second degree of Freemasonry pictured here with the ladder. Here's an image here, the ladder to heaven. And this is a process called distillation in alchemy. Um, also here you could see on the two pillars, again, Gemini or the two twins of the serpents. You see here the pineal gland, the cone. This is the seat of the soul as uh, Aristotle talked about, right? And this is uh, where uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine is released, which is the spirit molecule. It's also, tryptamines are a part of the, the mushroom spirit, which is all part of this mythology as well, of the galactic center. We'll talk about that more in, in the mystery school, but um, what I wanna share about distillation is that distillation is associated with the bird's eye perspective. And this bird's eye or third eye perspective um, is, is when we've purified ourselves. We've gone through these stages um, where we've danced with the shadow, where we've danced with the serpent. And again, that's the movement of the sun, the solar hero in each of us from Scorpio to Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. And that time period in our consciousness is when we go through putrefactio and alchemy. That's when we boil the, the solution, the muck inside of us, that thick mass of molasses, that dark shadow, we boil it to purify it one last time. And so in distillation, we are able to distance ourselves from all of that embodied chaos and all of that multiplicity play, all of the duality. And we start to rise into this unitive consciousness in this bird's eye perspective, this third eye perspective. And this is, um, when our psychic abilities start to open up. And this is what's happening for all of us now. And with this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius, when we start to have the vision of what's possible that, that unites all of us, that third eye humanitarian vision of unity and uh, idealism, right? Um, it reminds me, this purification process of something called Sananga. Sananga is this potent eye medicine that traditional Amazonian people, the tribes people use for many reasons, one of them to increase the night vision. So what you do is actually you drop this like this uh, sananga, which is a, a part of a tree, but it's the liquid form. 
they drop it into the eyes and it burns. I've had this experience in my life. Um, but it clears your vision and it opens up the night vision. So it was used by tribes people for hunting, but also for spiritual insight. It's often combined with the combo, the frog medicine, which is a, a purgative um, that goes in and cleanses the organs. Um, I think that that's what's happening right now. We are cleansing our perception. And part of that perception is about the us and them, the duality. We're moving into this unitive framework of, of a galactic cosmology, which includes all of our galactic kindred, all of the, the species on this planet, this oneness that we know is our, our truth. Um, and again, this is portrayed through the ladders of ascension that we see in alchemy and in, in distillation. Um, so it's a mental stage distillation where the risen spirit has become this feathered serpent. And it joins the birds with this ascended perspective to be able to also, like Aquarius, who is the water bearer, who's able to see the stories that we've been swimming or even drowning in during the Piscean age. And we're able to get the healthy distance and rewrite, rescribe the story with the spirit of Thoth, Tehuti, the bird scribe. We are writing an entire new mythology. We are the scribes of this new mythos. But in order to do that, we have to see the patterns that have taken place before. And this is where astrology and numerology and human design and other systems of pattern recognition and energy analysis, this is where we are able to get that distance and then from that place, script a new reality. And I believe in 2021, astrology is going to become such a dominant language that we are going to feel an accelerated evolution because we are studying ourselves collectively and personally on such a deep level. Astrology is a very Aquarian topic and it's a topic that can liberate us by that pattern recognition that then we can use to evolve our souls and our relationships and our careers and where we live in the world and all those great ways that we can use astrology. So when we do astrological work, we have to actually make a conscious ascent from the earth plane through the planetary spheres, through the spheres of the fixed stars and return to spirit. And this is an intentional decision in our souls, moving through the karmas of the chakras, moving through the instructions of our planetary teachers. And we see the twisting tributaries and the rhyming rivulets and the protruding paths, the whole canyons of curvature that have formed our identity. And then we can learn and to appreciate the interdependent nature of the cosmos, of the characters, of the soul contracts that have really scribed the story of our lives. And then from that place, we can write uh, the next stories. And this is where we, as this feathered serpent, this al alchemist, this transmutation that's taken place within us, we get this Aquarian vantage point, and then we can teach others, we can message the next stage of consciousness on the planet, which we all need to be doing at this time. And we become actually like the god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, like Kuku Khan, which you're gonna see right here, the feathered serpent. In the Mayan tradition, Kuku Khan was the civilizing god. Uh, he brought civilization, arts and culture and writing. And again, it's very connected with this Gemini North Node, this Gemini eclipse season that is upon us this year and next year. So we have to learn how to use both our inner technologies and our outer technologies, the spiritual technologies and our physical technologies to liberate each other and ourselves, to innovate, to bring the fresh, the new, the experimental, and to educate ourselves. We use prayer, we use meditation, we use song. We use mantra as this alchemical distillation process. And this is written into the constellations above, the swan and the lyre or the vulture. So I'm gonna share for a few minutes about those constellations. Let me go back to that part of the sky. Here is Cygnus, here's the vulture or lyra, right? And Ocula the eagle is right here. And here is Nekbet and Wajet. Here is the cobra and the vulture, often peer together. Vulture in Egypt was 
the mother goddess, the protector goddess, actually, and um, very connected with the mysteries and with the powers of regeneration. And that is what's so powerful with these constellations that are along the Milky Way. They have so much to do about ushering the soul between the dimensions. And when you see um, the, the mythology around the Lear, Orpheus's Lear, which has a lot to do with the sad songs of his loss to his partner, um, when she was bitten by the serpent. Um, her name was Eurydice. She's taken to the underworld and Orpheus has to, uh, he goes into this deep grieving and his songs are so powerful that Persephone and Hades will, 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 will release Eurydice on the condition that Orpheus doesn't look back when she's released from the underworld. But Orpheus is lose, loses his faith and he looks back at the last second and Eurydice is sucked back into the underworld and he never sees her again. And in this process, he's, he's, his songs are so sad, he's torn to shreds by the, the, the bake, which are these, these sort of uh, crazy, orgiastic, uh, feminine spirits who worship Dionysus, but they tear him apart. And his lyre gets tossed into the river, like the river Milky Way. But his songs continue. And the lyre is, uh, is taken out of the, the river. And it's, it's taken out by the vulture sent by Zeus. This is very important because the vulture is always the symbol of spiritual regeneration. That our songs of faith can continue beyond this plane. But we have to trust in the process of healing. And this is very, very powerful. This is the journey of alchemy. We can't stop halfway. And this is our moment right now. This is the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction coming in. We have to see that bright Christmas star light that's calling all of us to awaken to Christ consciousness, to be the Christ, to not project our savior or our blame outside of us. And so this is the journey of the vulture. To, to trust our inner senses and our outer senses, the smell, the sight, and to trust the power of song within us. Um, everything that's born must perish, but it will be transformed. And this is one of the lessons that the vulture teaches. Now the swan also teaches us about this. The swan, Cygnus, is one of the, it's, it's one of the oldest constellations represented. We see it in caves, also around the world. It's actually connected with a lot of the Hindu tradition, the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of wisdom and music. Um, the river Saraswati was actually a mirror of the Milky Way above. And specifically, there were uh, pilgrimage sites associated with this river that are connected with the dark rift of the Milky Way, which is where Cygnus the Swan is. Um, there was also a shamanic practice in the ancient Hindu tradition of wearing swan feather cloaks, which enabled the gods to take the form of the swan. In, also in pagan cultures across Europe, the swan was seen as a psychopomp, a soul carrier, a shamanic energy escorting human souls to and from the place of the afterlife. Also, we can see that um, the swan is very connected to this cosmic mother energy represented in this goddess Boan in Ireland or in Newt, the sky goddess in ancient Egypt. But the swan is always this source of creative fertility, but in the cold and in the dark, because it's a cold loving bird. Poetry, dreams, mysticism, um, all of this lives in the swan. And you might know the story of the swan song which is, uh, it became a, a very powerful legend, even Plato talked about it, that swans do sing early in their life, but not so much. What's really powerful is that they have this song that's so beautiful in the moment just before they die. And that there is actually this journey for all of us right now to find our swan song, the song that at the end of this cycle, at the end of the Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, and Capricorn, at the end of this earth energies, right? This, this denser energies before we fully ascend and gain our wings, 
we need to find the song that we want to send out to the planet at this time, because this song is going to reverberate and then build the notes and the orchestral elements and the instruments of the great symphony of this unfolding Aquarian age that is rising with this Christmas star, with the solstice star right around the corner here. So what is your swan song? What is the song that you want to give to the world at this time? That's your invitation for our meditation as we close this journey here today. So I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes and to start to take a breath in to your heart from the stars and from the constellations of the vulture, Lyra, from Cygnus the swan, and the stars, Altair and the others of the great eagle. And bring them down into your heart on the in-breath and hold that breath at the heart. And feel the medicine of the stars, of distillation, of the feathers, of the winged ones. Enter your heart and send that energy down to the earth and bring it into the core, the crystal core of our mother. So send that star wisdom into the core and feel its roots in the tree of life, which reach and extend down from your toes. And then take the next breath up from those roots, up from that crystal core, and send that crystal into the flaming center of your sacred heart and hold the breath in your sacred heart. And now on the exhale, when you're ready, send that energy up the crown and send it all the way out to the stars and the constellations and all the star families and star nations and tribes and all of our galactic kindred and feel this feathered serpent start to grow in you. This, this shaman dancing the tree of life, this serpent energy gaining its wings. And on the next breath, I wanna invite you to take your hands and feel them at the sacrum, the base of your body at the root chakra. And in the inhale, Raise your feathered serpent wings. Raise them on either side of you. Take that inhale and take the medicine of the stars and the medicine of the earth and bring them into the breath and let that breath reside and pulse and beat at your sacred flaming heart. Take the wings up, the wings of the vulture, the wings of the Cygnus, the swan, and Ocula, the eagle. And hold that breath at the top. And now on the exhale, send this rainbow shimmering light down with the wings. As if you're gifting this glorious rainbow iridescent energy to the entire planet. Sending the wings down. That feathered serpent inside of you. Take another breath, inhaling from the sacrum. Feel that serpent start to dance. You might feel your your body starts to sh shiver and shake a bit as the kundalini coils and uncoils and reach that serpent, that cobra, wajet, reach her up to meet the wings and the tip of the beak of the vulture of Mekbet and then send that energy down and bless the planet with this feathered serpent energy. And you may note that you may see Quetzalcoatl, you may see Kukulkan, you may see this feathered serpent before you. And there may be a message for you, for you as a messenger now, for you as a light and a torch to bear in this unfolding and emergent and expansive Aquarian age about to erupt on this planet. This total solar eclipse on Monday at the galactic center. Who are you as the feathered serpent, as the civilizing God, the Aquarian God or goddess, the messenger? shaping the next stage of evolution and consciousness on this planet. So I invite you to take another deep breath into the heart, bring those wings in and just give yourself an embrace. If you wanna open your eyes and come back, And if you would like to leave a little share about your meditation, you're welcome to do that in the chat. This is just a little uh, invocation 
today for this solar eclipse and this mystical Jupiter-Saturn conjunction on the solstice. Next week on the 17th, a week from today, we'll be doing the 2021 astro-numerology astro -numerology forecast, accelerated evolution and the Aquarian revelation. And I'll be going deeply into all of these cycles, including Jupiter-Saturn, squaring Uranus, the big cycle of next year, all of the eclipses, the retrogrades, how this will uh, be affected by and be affecting the virus and our collective consciousness, travel, all of these topics. And we'll be doing shamanic journeys and working with music and movement to embody all of these cycles. I hope this has been inspiring for you today that you connect with these astrological myths. I'm gonna go a lot deeper into them next week because we are really at this moment of I believe collectively accessing this galactic intelligence, this galactic consciousness, where we've moved out of this, you know, earthly identity and out of even just the solar system identity, and we're moving into this galactic centric consciousness. And this is all of our journeys now. This is an invitation from the feathered serpent, from Kuku Khan, this powerful feathered energy within each of us to grow, to soar, to share our light and our wisdom with the world. So I hope that you will continue to do that every day. Look at the sky, get under the night sky, look at the Pleiades rising with, Osi with Osiris or Orion in the sky on the west in eastern sky every night. And look at that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction and get under a telescope if you can and see them all together. Um, please join us next week. Um, if you get on my newsletters, you'll, you'll be seeing the link. I'll post it also in the Facebook group. And uh, wonderful to, to be with everyone here today. So much love and light. If you want a personal interpretation, I'll also be doing a little bit of that for the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. There's a few spots left for that uh, if you're interested next week. But all the best to everyone. Um, namaste. May you heal and inspire and empower in every day of your lives. Namaste.